This is a very short video. Uh, normally I'm into comedy videos and that kind of rubbish, but occasionally you have to be serious in life and this is one of those times. So hopefully this will help somebody. Um, it's a bit of a tips video on how to deal with uh, bailiffs and debt collectors if you have been a victim of identity fraud, which I have been. It, it's such a long process that to try and get to the end of it, you, you need help because it just drags on and on and on and it causes you so much stress and aggro and upset and, uh, you know, along the way. But so now finally I've got this resolved. I think it's about time to try and help other people because to people that don't know about all this, you you could end up paying a lot of money, uh, affecting your credit score and everything else. So um, i start off with a little bit of story about me. Years and years and years ago, um, I had a girlfriend that screwed me out of a lot of money um, and it just went on and on. I haven't seen or spoke to the girl in over a decade. And then once that was all paid off, I thought that was it. So when I started to get uh, some letters f uh, through a couple of years ago, I assumed it was a result of her, but it actually wasn't. It was a case of mistaken identity, fraud, whatever you may call it. So I started getting letters like these, idiots like them, and twerps like these, uh, who basically don't know the law. Now to the untrained eye, if you saw these letters come through, you'd be a bit worried thinking you owe money and etc. blah, blah, blah. You know, if you do genuinely owe money for debt, then you gotta pay it basically, unless there's reasons and laws that help you get out of that debt. So I started receiving these letters and the creditors that I allegedly owed money to didn't tally. I'm thinking one of them was BT for example. Um, I've never had a BT land iron in my life. I've never had any dealings with BT, nothing like that whatsoever. So it's rung alarm bells. Um, BT were very uncooperative. They're one of the three companies. And basically they, this is, uh, well, I can only call companies like these debt scavengers. And what they do is they contact financial institutions or places where um, debt has been registered. Uh, they just basically purchase a spreadsheet for money by hounding the, the companies involved and then prey on people's misery by trying to recoup this money. Now in this case, I had these are all old as well. They're like 2004, 2005, you know, it's 2017 now. Why am I getting letters last year saying that I owe money from years and years ago at first instance? Why has there been no communication to say, oh, I've been at this address for years, so why have they not told me about it? Why am I now suddenly getting threatening, intimidating, bullying letters from these people? And when you first see them, you think, oh, you get, you get a bit worried. Um, but these Mickey Mouse, two Bob amateur companies, um, don't know their own law, so they're just chances. And they're trying to get away with what they can. So I've done a lot of research on this matter and I've gone through hours and hours of videos, Googling um, scenarios where people have had the same situation. And uh, finally it's helped me um, conclude the matter successfully. So if you are in this position, I strongly suggest that you take a few of these tips. I'm just trying to help you. I know this is a bit of a cheesy video, and uh, it seems like it's almost self-importance and I want people to like this video. Honestly, I promise you that is not the case. I went through so much aggro trying to get this all sorted out. And if it wasn't for other people online, etc., sharing their information, uh, to give you a few, Mark Salon, Colin Johnson, Russell Barton, people like them, absolutely magnanimous in there, brilliant. And I couldn't have done it without those people, so thank you very much. And I think it's just a case of spreading awareness that these clowns and jokers can't get away with trying to rip people off. So the first thing you do if you receive one of these letters, um, you don't have a contract with these people as such. If they're, the alleged debt in this case uh, was BT. So to receive a letter from a company like this, they are a third party interloper. You have no contract with them, no obligation to speak to them. They'll consistently hound you, whatever you send back, but, um, you are under no obligation to speak to them whatsoever. So I've just made a few notes that I went back on. So I said I've got no ob obligation to deal with you. Stop bullying me, stop harassing me. This will not be tolerated kind of thing. Now, a couple of the acts or laws that you can use um, that they have potentially breached or will be breaching um, are some of the following. So it's worth having a look at these and adding them to your correspondence if necessary. 
So section 20 of the Theft Act 1968. Now that revolves to blackmail. First of all, they're sending me these letters. You know, I've got nothing to support this. Leave me alone. Section two of the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. Quite explanatory harassment, you know, bugger off. The Data Protection Act of 1998, uh, many breaches there, another one you'll have to look into, but worth always quoting these. And the main one for me, regardless of this being fraud, um, the Limitations Act of 1980. Now this is an important one because if you have an aged debt which is over six years old, these morons have got no right to contact you. Um, they will persist to contact you, but they have no right to contact you. There is no debt. That debt effectively, if you have got a legitimate debt, which is over six years old, it's null and void under the Statute of Limitations, uh, sorry, the Limitations Act of 1980. So if you get a court paper through um, from these other morons, then all you've got to do is send it back in your defence to say under the uh, Limitations Act of 1980 and this it's statute barred so hopefully what you'll do is then get a follow-up letter from the debt recovery agency in question and they'll confirm that your balance is nil and that the case has been closed. If this goes on and on and on I mean this is only mail correspondence whether it be email try and do everything in writing as well don't take phone calls there's a lot of things they'll say on the phone um, that they won't say in the letter and if you do have a phone call please record it because it can be used against them whether they say they're recording their calls for training and quality purposes you know all, all the rubbish they feed you so if they do say that a bailiff is going to be turning up at your door for whatever reason uh, I would go back beforehand and request the following information prior to them uh, coming round so first of all, you want a copy of the liability order. Um, if they do, if you do have a bailiff come around, they claim they have a warrant. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, uh, it will be a bogus warrant. They go on Google, they get a template of an act, uh, sorry, of a warrant. They'll just fill out the name of yourself and the supposed creditor, stick it in your face, won't even show it to you and they'll claim that they have the right to access your property regardless of your will or not. Completely untrue. If they do have a warrant, um, it has to be signed by an individual judge in wet ink and it must have the court's crest seal on it. No bailiff will ever have this because no court will issue it. The only time they will issue that kind of warrant is in the case of a criminal offence um, or whether it's uh, council tax. Uh, and council tax is a big one because, you know, it's all corrupt. They're all governed anyway. And has anyone ever questioned where you actually pay your council tax? Where's it going? Is it emergency services, NHS, or is it other things? Are they buying arms? Is it... Each to their own opinion on that one. But, you know, why do I bother paying national insurance if that's the case? But anyway, the next thing you want is a deed of assignment. So this is the proof of your claim in a signed affidavit. Then they're, they're never gonna have this either because it's all law breaking, they're underhand in bully boy tactics, trying to trick you. And again, to the innocent person, you open the door, you see the bailiff, they throw a warrant in your face. You're thinking, oh, I'm in trouble here. What do I do? I better let these people in. And no, don't, you don't consent. The first thing you do is you don't consent. Um, just on that subject, um, you need to remove the implied right of access and you need to tell them that in advance ideally, which means when they turn up at your property, if they do trespass on there and you've already issued the implied right of access, you can charge them 5,000 pound, whatever else. If they are insistent on uh, coming in, you know, you've got to call the police. Now the police, do, now, the police do a fantastic job for criminal reasons, but they are not there for civil matters. So if a police officer turns up, they are there for breach of the peace for criminal purposes only. They are not there to assist and facilitate bailiffs as sometimes they might do because although their knowledge in the criminal field is very good, their knowledge of the civil law is not that great. And that's why you'll have these um, bailiffs turn up. They will manipulate police officers into thinking that those fake warrants, you know, a fraudulent instrument to gain access to your property is real. And it's not, I cannot stress to you enough, it is not. So if a police officer does turn up for a breach of the peace, they then start facilitating the bailiffs. You need to ask for their sergeants to get this arranged. It, it's a long process. And then if not, the 
uh, deputy um, inspector. Um, you also want confirmation of the debt that you've allegedly signed. So this is the original instrument of indebtedness. Now, because they're a third party interloper, if there is, in, in my case, it was fraud, so they couldn't. They would need to go to the original company, say, for example, BT. They would then need to provide me with confirmation that there is proof of debt. You know, I can't go around someone else's house and say, you owe me four grand, I've got no proof, but here you go. And that's what these bullies do. Um, you want that validation of full accounting executed legally and signed by the grantor, endorsed by a witness in solemn form. If they cannot provide these documentations, um, what well, I believe that they are a party to a fraudulent act as a third party interloper. They have no power and therefore you reserve the full right to seek full recourse through the course of law. Now these out and out scumbags will send companies such as Capita or G4S um, to the property. Um, if they do turn up and the police aren't available, whatever, they persist in their way in and you've already given them implied right of access, not only are they breaking the law, but there are other things um, that you should ask for as well. So for example, if it were me and they turned up, if they could provide me with the original proof of debt, which they can't, if they can provide me with a legitimate warrant, which they can't, I would then be asking for a copy of their CRB check. You know, it's your property. You don't know this person from Adam. Produce these bogus documents and then they expect to gain entry to your property. How do I know this person's not a killer, a paedophile, whatever? Um, so I'd ask for that. I'd also say that if you do want to access my property, I'm charging you £100,000. This is payable on cash prior to entry. Um, I'm happy to give you a receipt for that, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, they're not going to do it. Now, when... The next thing I would be doing is serving them under the Protection of Harassment Act of 1970. This is to cease and persist doorsteps, uh, doorstop visit. This includes unauthorised communication such as text messages, phone calls, letters. You've already told them, you have no contract with them, you have no consent, no obligation to, to deal with them. Therefore, if they continue bothering and pestering you with their illegitimate paperwork, which is fraudulent and incorrect, you will then be going back and serving them with your own fee bill schedule to um, have a look at their correspondence and reply to it. So first of all, they'll be breaching section 127 of the Communications Act 2003. Uh, so once you impose your fee schedule, uh, this can be X amount of number of words per letter. Um, it, it can be done on, on various ways. There are many examples online of templates you can use for fee bills and things, and a couple of the people I mentioned earlier uh, will be able to guide you through that process. Um, if you do get to a point where you're issuing your fee bill, um, you know, you can add on there uh, trademark infringements, um, unrebutted agreement sent, and also send them by recorded mail. Um, add your recorded delivery at a thousand pound a pop. Um, invalid contract email and letters per the issuance that you've already given them, etc. Um, and that's basically it. There's a lot more to it. And these people do not give up. They are very persistent. But you've got to challenge them because if you don't, then these people are just going to keep coming back. And the way I view this and the way, reason I'm so passionate about it is although I've now got this resolved, I, I really do want to help other people because what if this is a member of your family, you know, a loved one or even someone you don't know, don't necessarily care about? Would you want the same happening to them that, that you've had through it? It's very stressful and I've had to write thousands of communications to go back to these people. It's been batting to and fro. It's just gone on and on far too long. And I'm, obviously it's a weight off my shoulders to have it resolved, but it's a long process. Why should you have to defend your innocence? It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But if I didn't, chances are I would have been taken to court and then who knows what would have happened from there, a bent judge, whatever. Um, but there wasn't a pun in there, by the way. Um, occasionally what I do well, and in fact, in some circumstances, it's not probably correct. It's up to you how you choose to do it. But I tend to go back and I put a counter offer in and I say, outside of the fee schedule that I've already submitted, I feel that the, the upset, the hurt, the trauma, um, the time it's taken out of my core production to respond to all these people, you know, I'm getting in from work, getting these letters coming through, they're going nowhere. I'm having to take time to read them, respond them, research them, take advice. 
etc. And it all adds up. So for all of that, asking for a full and final settlement figure can be whatever you want. I normally ask for sort of five thousand pounds, and then I'm prepared to forgive the matter. Otherwise, then you go on to seek legal action if you so require. Another thing that's worth mentioning is the Magna Carta Libertatum of, I believe it's 1215, I haven't actually got it written down here, um, I believe it's 1215 um, about the law of the land and there's some interesting points in there, if you can watch a video on that, um, that will really help you out as well. Um, and that's it really, if I can help one person overcome the, the grief and the aggro that I've gone through, then fair enough. So not a silly video, hopefully, hopefully it will benefit you. Um, if I can help you at all, then so be it. Thank you and good night.